To whom much is given, much is required. The price of greatness is responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. There are a lot of ways of saying it, but we have this idea across cultures and across history that social privilege should be balanced by social responsibility. We as a species are okay with giving certain people special privileges so long as they have a corresponding level of obligation. When a power structure usually breaks down is when the ruling class's level of privilege exceeds their level of perceived contribution. Burn For Me by Alona Andrews very much explores this idea of social privilege versus social responsibility. This is my personal interpretation of the 356 pages in this book. I'm not trying to infer anything about the author's intent, opinions, or beliefs, because I don't know that. This is my interpretation, my analysis, my thoughts, my opinions. We won't be discussing the rest of the series, but there are so many spoilers ahead for book one. Cool? Let's go. Burn For Me takes place in an alternative modern-day Houston. In this version of Earth, the wealthy aristocrats took this serum, which unlocked their magical powers, turning them into mages in the 19th century. 150 years later, the descendants of those original mages have strategically intermarried to try and produce the most powerful offspring. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Magic users fall into five categories. Minor, average, notable, significant, and prime. As you might have guessed, primes are the scariest and the most rare. Don't ask me where all the house's money comes from because I'm still not quite clear on that, but in general, the more powerful you are, the more likely you are to be rich because, um, eugenics. Our main character is Nevada Baylor. Nevada is a very rare truth seeker, which is exactly what it sounds like. She can tell if you're lying. She is a mage, but she's not part of a house. She's a private investigator whose company is a subsidiary of a larger firm. This book centers on Nevada's interactions with two primes. There is Adam Pierce, who is our main villain, and there is Connor Rogan, who is our love interest. Pierce and Rogan are excellent contrast to each other because in each of them we see what the other had the capacity to be. They have a lot of similarities. Both are primes, both grew up in luxury, both come from prestigious houses, both of them have a lot of academic achievements, and both of them have massive amounts of potentially destructive magic. But there are several key differences, and one of the major ones is this issue of responsibility. Adam Pierce is what you get when the power and the privilege are not constrained by rules and responsibility. He is a prime pyrokinetic, and he wants everyone to know that he is a prime pyrokinetic. He is a noted troublemaker, has been arrested 16 times in the past 12 months, and is now wanted for murder. It's alleged murder, but like, we all know he did it. Pierce's family really want him to turn himself in before law enforcement put him out of everyone else's misery. So Nevada gets assigned by her boss to first of all find Adam, and second of all persuade him to turn himself in. Pierce is a psycho who is used to getting what he wants. When Nevada first manages to get in touch with him, he like tries to jump in bed with her and she's like, um, thanks, but no thanks. And he's like genuinely surprised. Like who wouldn't want to sleep with him? Like it's just, we learned about this one incident when Pierce was in middle school where he almost burned a man to death over a candy bar. He's been arrested again and again throughout his adult life, but his family have always made sure that he gets bailed out. Pierce is currently on the run from the law, but his mother keeps wiring him money because she doesn't want to make life, and I quote, so unpleasant for him. Did I mention that Pierce is wanted for a grisly murder? There is nothing remotely like accountability or consequences in Pierce's life. Yet he somehow still feels trapped by society. He continually tells Nevada that her family are dragging her down, and at one point tries to take out her grandma in order to set Nevada free. Pierce continually says that, like, obeisance, reverence, tribute is owed to him because of reasons. He's crazy, and I don't think it's supposed to make sense. But Adam Pierce has a gang, and it involves this one kid who is a cousin to Connor Rogan. Connor Rogan is this super powerful prime telekinetic, and currently the head of House Rogan. Rogan is a battle mage who is sometimes called Mad Rogan. He is also known as the Scourge of Mexico, the Butcher of Merida, and Uri Khan. He's a scary dude. Because he is the head of House Rogan, Connor's cousin comes to him at the start of the book and asks him for help finding her son, who is Connor's first cousin once removed. Connor Rogan's cousin asks him to get her son out of Adam Pierce's gang. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, Connor Rogan is a great example of lawful good doesn't mean lawful nice. He comes across as morally ambiguous, but we do find out that Connor Rogan has a very strict moral code. It just doesn't necessarily align with the rest of society. 
Nevada and Rogan do end up teaming up to find Pierce, but not before Rogan decides it's okay for him to kidnap Nevada and interrogate her for information on Pierce's whereabouts. But Rogan doesn't actually hurt her, and he does take her home after. Rogan is totally cool with unaliving a random gangster in the swamp. Nevada kind of gets a little freaked out about it, and this is Rogan's justification for it. This way, I only had to kill one person rather than kill half a dozen of his followers. I saved several lives. That's an incomplete quote, but um, he's not wrong. Rogan also has no problems <laughs> Pierce's ex-girlfriend in her own dress when it becomes clear she's covering for Pierce. Rogan just doesn't mind doing bad things to what he sees as bad people. Like Pierce, Rogan expresses disdain for the expectations that have been placed upon him. Who he would have been allowed to marry, where he could have gone to school, how many children he could have had, all of that was decided for him. Like Pierce, Rogan rebelled against his family and ran away. But instead of starting a biker gang, Rogan went and joined the US Army. He gives a couple of reasons for this to Nevada. One is that he says it was the only way he could legally unalive people. He also says that the US government was the only entity strong enough to protect him from his family. Nevada's power tells her that both of those things are true. But I do find it interesting that even Rogan's rebellion was to join an institution known for its rules. So Pierce has rebelled by seeking anarchy. Rogan rebelled by seeking order. Rogan is considered a war hero, but has left the army and now acts as the head of his house. He stays out of the public eye and has a reputation as something of a hermit. The opposite of Pierce, who constantly demands attention from everyone. Rogan did leave the army, but he has kind of recreated his own version of it. He hires a lot of former military to work with him, and he does show this almost protectiveness toward veterans in general. Rogan does have high standards for his employees. He says this, and we see this. Rogan also takes very good care of them, and Nevada picks up on a lot of loyalty that they have for him in turn. Rogan provides gainful employment to a lot of people whose skills just don't apply to the civilian sector. We see a couple instances where he deliberately seeks out people who couldn't find employment anywhere else. The first time we see Rogan express anything like empathy, it involves another veteran. There's this friend of Nevada's, Bug, who had this procedure done when he was in the military that basically allows him to plug into computer feeds, but it means that his mind is basically fragmenting because of all the data pouring into it. When he meets Bug, Rogan's rigid control up to this point cracks like just enough that Nevada notices. And so she asks him about it. And uh, Rogan says, it bothers me that they do this to soldiers, squeeze everything they can out of them and then discard them like garbage. People know this goes on and nobody gives a sh acceptable losses. This is another difference between Pierce and Rogan. Rogan, despite what he would like everyone to believe, does think about other people. He does think about social issues outside himself. Pierce, on the other hand, decides it would be fun to burn down the entire city of Houston to prove how great he is. Pierce is working with this, like, shadow organization that has convinced him to do this. We don't find out too much about said mystery organization in this book, but Pierce's hubris is what allows this organization to use him. At the final confrontation, when Nevada and Rogan are trying to stop Pierce from immolating the entire city of Houston, Nevada says, like, there's ordinary people who will be caught in the flames, like, they don't have anything to do with your rebellion. And Pierce says, they have everything to do with it. They are dragging us down. They prevent us from taking what is rightfully ours. And he continues with his rant. And then there's this line where he says, we had it pounded into us that what is good is whatever benefits the majority. So the primes and the mage houses do have some sense that they have social responsibility. This is something that Rogan ascribes to, and it's something that other primes in the story talk about. But Adam is like, why should I care about their laws and their needs? If I have the power to obtain and keep the object of my desire, then I should be able to do so. Then he continues his little rant and he's like, I am severing the chains. Why Pierce thinks that his all expense paid, consequences free, bad boy existence is bondage, it doesn't make sense, but I already told you he's crazy. Pierce feels like he is super awesome, and because of that, he should be able to do whatever he wants, unrestrained. Rogan does not lose sleep over breaking the law, but like he is one of the people who helped elect this tough on crime district attorney to help reign in the houses. Rogan does follow his own code of honor. Instead of evacuating Houston when he knows Pierce is going to destroy it, Rogan stays with Nevada and tries to help her stop him. He risks his own life to do this as a private citizen. Rogan and Nevada only meet because Rogan is trying to help his family. When one of Rogan's employees gets hurt on the job, Rogan sees to it that that man receives medical attention and is cared for in his recovery. Rogan gets hurt at the same time, but he continues to try and hunt down Pierce despite sustaining some serious ouchies. 
There is one line that really encapsulates the difference between Rogan and Pierce and is what got me thinking about this topic in this book in the first place. At the end of the book, Rogan and Nevada have captured Pierce. Rogan says, we don't kill civilians. We don't show off in public and scare people. We don't abuse our power. You f you're a disgrace. Rogan has no problem throwing his weight around and taking full advantage of his power and position. But he does that within boundaries and in the course of fulfilling what he sees as his responsibilities. We see that his responsibilities to him include looking after the people who depend on him, his employees, his family, stopping psycho primes from burning down Houston, and looking after the general welfare of his region. Rogan hurts people when he sees them as threats. And he doesn't have a problem using fear tactics like he repeatedly tries to get Nevada to call him Mad Rogan. I don't know why I thought it was funny, but I did. But he doesn't pick fights for fun and he doesn't use his power to advance himself. He knows that his power and just he himself as a person needs to be constrained by rules for the sake of society. I think this is part of why he falls in love with Nevada. She is a compassionate person with a very strong sense of justice and she is firm enough in her beliefs that she does challenge him, she does push back on him. Nevada is also able to pull him out of this trance where he almost destroys Houston himself. No one else has been able to do that, not even Rogan himself. Nevada reigns him in even more than he can rein himself in. Rogan knows, at least on some level, that he needs that. I want to emphasize that Rogan does not come across as nice at all. There's this one scene where he mentions like a friend and I was like, how do you have friends? Honestly, I didn't start liking his character until one scene where he's driving and he swerves his car to avoid hitting a squirrel. But I appreciate how we get all these subtle cues he's not actually a bad guy mixed in with these outrageous, aggressive statements and these moments of explosive violence. This is a fantastic book. I haven't even mentioned the electric chemistry between Nevada and Rogan, but it is there and it is fun. Also Nevada's sniper mother, horny grandma, and assorted younger cousins and siblings. I snort laughed multiple times while reading this book. I can be very picky when it comes to depictions of power, but I love this book and just everything I've read from Alona Andrews uh, really handles the topics of leadership and power and responsibility really well. They're really good. I hope you enjoyed my analysis attempting to prove that romance novels can indeed have deep themes. Let me know which of these three topics you'd like me to cover next, and uh, we can analyze another romance novel next time. Have you.